Baseball Tonight, the podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Buster Oli, and this is the Baseball Tonight podcast for Thursday, July 10th, 2014. On this date in baseball history, in 1968, the American League and the National League agreed on a new playoff format, plus expansion. Each league would be divided into 12 teams with two 16 divisions It was a radical change because, of course, for years, the American League and the National League basically had one winner come out and meet in the World Series, and this set up the League Championship Series as we know it today. The most expensive free agent pitcher in baseball history might be facing a major injury, and something really bad happened in the midst of our talk with Johnny Damon. Just listen for the crashing sound. Let's get to it. The first pitch. There was a mountain of injury news on Wednesday. First, Yadier Molina, the Cardinals all-star catcher, injured his thumb. Rick Hummel of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch wrote in today's paper that he suffered the sprained thumb on a slide in third base in the second inning as he tried to brace himself from coming off the bag. He came out before his next at bat, and he had an MRI. The results could be available this morning. Now, the Cardinals won 5-2, but after the game, the big talk for Mike Matheny was about Molina's injury. Well, anytime we have to take him out, I mean, you know, it's pretty bad. Went through some tests, and you could feel some some irritation there. Obviously, you know, he was still trying. He got taped up. Was convinced he was going back in, but we needed to get it looked at. Before we get to the rest of the injuries, let's talk about some of the game action from yesterday. Kansas City had a big win. They were down four to two in the ninth inning. Salvador Perez with a clutch home run, and he spoke with Fox Sports Kansas City after the game. This is a big win for the Royals. You go home with a winning road trip, and it was that close to being a losing road trip and a losing series. How huge is this for the team? That's not awful, the thing. You know, I think every game, every day we play, we we, we play for win, you know, and that's important for the team every night. What about to win today, too? You come to the park, and suddenly you find out that your all-star left fielder is out with a wrist injury, and you also lose Moustakis. He has the flu. So, I mean, you guys are playing shorthanded tonight. You know, it's hard. It's hard, but they got another you know, player yeah, can do it his job, you know. So that's, that's going to happen sometime in, in the season. Somebody get hurt, you know. But we got a guy who can do it in the same way Alice and Mike do it. What's the feeling like when that ball comes off the bat and you realize that you just gave your team a chance <laughs> to win? I don't know. It's, you know, I see it so close to the, to the pool, so I stay in home play to see the first, you know, foul ball in. Good for for, for us. Now, the injuries that were referenced there, Alex Gordon, their all-star left fielder, has a sprained wrist. He's going to be examined further. Mike Moustakis is out with the flu. And, oh, yeah, by the way, Jason Vargas, one of the most important members of the rotation, he had an appendectomy. So he's going to be out three to four weeks. The Detroit Tigers beat the Los Angeles Dodgers 4-1. to Max Scherzer, who's been on a roll lately, pitched great after the game. He talked about his slider. I didn't have my best stuff early. I didn't th- my slider in the first inning quite wasn't there yet, and then I made adjustment after the first inning, and that pitch was huge for me today. Uh, they were a very heavy right-handed lineup, and I was able to use my slider throughout the rest of the game, and I felt like that helped keep them off balance. The Angels just keep on winning. They beat Toronto 8-7 to after the game. Cole Calhoun, who had a big day and has an OPS of somewhere around 870. I was looking at that last night. Talked with Fox Sports LA about the game. Cole, this team's 27th come from behind victory, probably one of the more interesting ones today. But what allowed this team to come back the way you did? We just stayed in it. We had the bullpen come in uh, after CJ, and, you know, they shut him down and gave us a chance. And the offense has been going good, clicking on all cylinders, so it gave us a shot to get out there and get the W. Now, Strowman had your number the first two at-bats, but you came back in and had a huge home run to tie the game in the fourth. What did you change about your approach? I just got a good pitch ahead. He was throwing, hitting his spots on me all day, and then uh, I, I got one that I could put a good swing on and uh, fortunately got it out of here. Now, this team has had a great home presence. What needs to happen to see these results on the road? We just need to keep doing what we're doing. We're getting good starting pitching, good bullpen, swinging about well. As we keep doing that, we'll be all right. Phillies closer Jonathan Papelbon chose the time right after the Phillies beat the Brewers again 4-1 to to answer questions about whether or not he would be okay with being traded. And his quote was, some guys want to stay on a losing team? Question mark. That's mind-boggling to me. I think that's a no-brainer. And he was referring to want to leave and go to a contender. 
He's owed a ton of money. I still think it's going to be really impractical for the Phillies to trade him. And I know from talking with evaluators with other teams that although Papelbon has been terrific this year, they still wonder at his age whether or not they would be buying into regression if they made a deal for him. The Red Sox designated catcher A.J. Brzezinski for assignment. They promoted catcher Christian Vasquez. Uh, so now going forward, the Red Sox will have a number of rookies in their lineup. This is not only about trying to get better in 2014 now, but it's really about restructuring the team for 2015. Blue Jays first baseman Adam Lind is out six to eight weeks because of a broken foot. He actually had gone to get an MRI on the advice of his mother. Brett Gardner was out of the Yankees lineup. He had an Donald issue. Yankees outfielder Carlos Beltran broke his nose in batting practice when he hit a ball off the cage and it hit him in the face. But that wasn't the worst injury news of the day for the Yankees, of course. They spent $175 million during the course of the winter on Masahiro Tanaka, $20 million in a posting fee, plus $155 million. And so huge red flags went up all across baseball when Tanaka had to leave the team to go get an MRI. We could know more later today about his condition, but the Yankees placed him on the disabled list because of elbow inflammation this is really bad news for the Yankees. As Brian McCann said, the Yankees catcher, we're hoping for the best. Now, Wallace Matthews of ESPN New York talked about the Yankees and what they're saying about Tanaka's situation right now. It's not good, but we don't really know how bad it is because Joe Girardi couldn't provide us with the results of the MRI. All he said was that they're waiting for the team doctor, Christopher Ahmad, to read the results before they make any determination of what to do next. He was asked about the potential cause of Tanaka's elbow injury. His velocity has been the same. He threw the, the pitch that Mike Napoli hit out two starts back to win the game with the Red Sox was 96 miles an hour. Last night, he was throwing between 92 and 94 when he threw a fastball. So, you know, it doesn't appear that that was the, the cause of the problem in the past two starts. More likely, it was the fact that he's going on four days rest, which is something he did not do in Japan at all in his seven-year career. Joe Girardi, the Yankees manager, stated the obvious. I mean, there wasn't anything that led us to believe there was anything wrong. I mean, it would be a big loss. I mean, anytime you lose a starting pitcher, they're hard to replace. And what he's done for us, the innings and the wins and the quality of starts, it's hard to replace. On baseball tonight, last night, Adnan Verk, Dallas Braden, and Eduardo Perez talked about the Tanaka injury. It wasn't that long ago that we were talking about Masahiro Tanaka and saying not only Rookie of the Year, but Cy Young, maybe MVP. Now all of a sudden he's on the 15-day disabled list, and it's a different conversation we're having with the Yankees ace. With Eduardo Perez and Dallas Braden and Madden Amber, let's take a look at the workload that Tanaka's been through. When it comes to the most innings as a pro through their age 25 season, Tanaka is fourth there with 1,444 and a third innings. Dallas, when you assess what's happened to him, what do you think is the biggest reason for this setback? Well, you take a look at that list there, and there's four horsemen, two out of the four. Uh, have been used to baseball over here in the States. You Darvish had to come over and make that transition on rest. It's the rest period. It's not necessarily the workload. Over in Japan, six, seven days off in between starts. Here in the States, four or five, depending on how the rotation is set up. So it's not necessarily the workload. It's the lack of rest in between that he's just not getting, that he's not accustomed to not having. Not only that, I was uh, texting with Aki Sasaki, the general manager of the Rakuten Golden Eagles, where Tanaka played uh, until he got here to the States. And it was interesting. He told me he had never seen so many split-finger fastballs thrown by Tanaka in Japan as much as he, he's throwing here. Now, take into account the rest period, as you said, and then add all the splitters compared to the sliders and fastballs he was throwing there, complementing it with a few splitters. It's a big toll on the elbow. It's a stress on the body, as you would know. And I think that really adds... To the, to the pressure that he is having right now on that elbow and the stress. He started out 11-1, and one, a sub-2 ERA, 1-3, and 4-and-a-quarter ERA in his last few starts, and clearly now this injury concern is something that's concerning all the New York Yankees brass. It's more than just a conversation. It's the Weekly Dish with Keith Law on Baseball Tonight. And, Keith, I guarantee you that last night when word of Masahiro Tanaka's diagnosis, and, well, it's not really a diagnosis. It's just the Yankees telling us that he has inflammation in his elbow, which is a symptom and not really a diagnosis, that people all around baseball with other teams were going, yep, figured that was going to happen at some point. I cannot tell you 
how many guys on other teams were saying to me in the first two months after they saw Tanaka, A, they had a ton of respect for him, they thought he was really good, but I heard over and over and over again, he's not going to hold up. And how long can he hold up throwing that many splitters? Because as you know, you know that particular pitch is known as an elbow killer. And he throws the highest percentage of splitters in baseball, and it's not even close. 25% for him. Hiroki Kuroda, who's 1,000 years old, throws 22.9%. And then you're down to Dan Heron at about 16%. And there was always, of course, the unknown uh, issue uh, or unknown answer to the question of how was all the pitches – uh, he threw in Japan, how much of a factor would that be in his future? It was a question that was raised by the Cubs, by the Diamondbacks, by the Dodgers, by the Yankees, all the teams that looked at him. And the bottom line is they didn't know about all the pitches he threw in Japan and how much of an impact that would be. You know, the one example specifically that we know of, of course, was how just last fall he threw 160 pitches, throwing game six of the uh, series in Japan, came back and pitched in relief the next day. And I think that's probably part of the reason why this is the maybe the least surprising news to a lot of people in baseball. Yeah, and there's, so there's two separate factors. One is he threw a lot. I mean, his pitch counts were higher over there. Their between starts routines over there are they're different. They throw more overall, and they throw more as kids too. Remember, we had the guy in the Koshian tournament. I think our magazine did a piece on him on yeah. how much that poor kid overthrew. And I've pointed out before, a different country, slightly different baseball culture, but in Taiwan, I think every Taiwanese prospect who signed for $400,000 or more has blown out his elbow, shoulder, or both after signing. So I'm not going to say that what they do over there is bad, but it's different. There's clearly a transition issue, and it does seem that the, ones who come, the players who come over here eventually do break down, and it's probably due to stuff that happened before they came over here in the first place. The splitter thing, I remember hearing that when I was with the Blue Jays. Oh, the splitter's an elbow killer, and I had, you probably know Jamie Bain, or you know his dad at least. He even handed me a baseball and had me try to grip it. I have tiny hands, so it's like, but which was actually better, though, because you could feel what it was doing in the elbow. But the explanation I always heard was, if your hands are big enough, you can probably get away with it. It's the pressure on the elbow then becomes less because it's harder, for, it's uh, easier for you to, to grip it, to get the ball actually between first and second fingers, or some do it with the second and third. It's more like a, a fork ball there. But, you know, it seems like some guys can throw it. Kuroda, you mentioned, he's been throwing it forever, and he's been fine. And if in, in Tanaka's case, if it's that it just puts more strain on his elbow. I'm say, I guess what I'm saying is it's an individual case. Some guys will be able to throw it for years and never have a problem, and for some guys it really will be a killer. And then in his case, if the issue is that he can't throw it without – causing issues to his elbow, and then he's throwing it one out of every four pitches because it's, you can understand why, it's a pretty good pitch, but then it's going to catch up to him sooner. Yeah, and to be clear, we the Yankees still don't have the information on exactly what's wrong with him. We haven't gotten a precise diagnosis, so who knows? Maybe this is a case where he's got something in the elbow, you know, a bone chip or whatever that's causing the inflammation. We'll have more information, presumably, later today. When that question came up, when I was working on a story on Tanaka in April about the splitter and how often he threw that, I had a long conversation with David Cohn, who threw splitters in his career, mm -hmm. and he told me that he didn't think that it would be as much of an impact for Tanaka because he said that, and he, and he basically held out his hand and demonstrated. He said, you know, he doesn't really throw the ball with the, doesn't throw the ball with it buried between his fingers like a lot of guys who throw the splitters. He puts it more in the back of his palm. Mm -hmm. And he also mentioned that, uh, and I, I talked to John Farrell and others about this, Larry Rothschild, the Yankees pitching coach, about the fact that a lot of the, the action that Tanaka used on his splitter actually came from his wrist. A lot of the guys who throw the splitter cone said are very stiff wrist, where in Tanaka's case it was more the action was with his wrist, which they interpreted as being something that could take pressure off the elbow and so they didn't think it was going to be as much of an issue. But I can tell you, after he started against the Red Sox in April, the next day I was around the batting cage, and David Ortiz was there, and Johnny Gomes was there, and David Ortiz said to me, I've never seen anybody throw a splitter that often. And yeah. he was asking the question, and Johnny Gomes was asking the question. And as I said, 
going from team to team to team, everybody was saying, how long can he throw that pitch? And you know what? The, the answer is we'll never know exactly if this particular pitch uh, has had an impact on what's going on now. Another thing that was mentioned by all those guys, Keith, was how hard he throws the pitch. This is not yeah. something where he just kind of flips it up there. He throws the hardest splitter of any splitter thrown in the big leagues as well, an average velocity of about 86 miles an hour. And so the, to the initial point, what's going on with his wrist, too, then he's making it more like a split change, which yep. you know, there's sort of this continuum. Some guys throw a pure splitter, some just throw a pure change up, like a palm ball, almost what you described, where – a yep. palm ball or a circle change, it's stuffed as far back in the hand as possible, and you need to turn that pitch over. Literally, you're rotating your wrist. The more laxity you have in the wrist, the better action you're going to get on the pitch. And I would say that's probably, with what little we know, we don't really know, we just sort of guess about the impact of these pitches. Most people will tell you the changeup is about the safest off-speed pitch to throw. If you throw it correctly, just like a fastball, there's very little risk to the elbow or to the shoulder. Uh, so trying to find a hybrid between the two, if there really is an added risk for the splitter, and I, I'll emphasize, we don't know. There's just this is sort of a this is conventional wisdom in baseball, where, yep. uh, but if you're trying to find a hybrid, you might take some of that pressure off of off of the elbow joint. But also, you know, I should mention again, like they throw in Japan and Korea too, they throw a lot of splitters, and every pitcher over there, every pitcher from. NPB, KBO that I've ever seen, and the little I've seen of Taiwan, they throw everything. Those kids throw kids. I mean, t teenagers, they throw five, six different pitches. They just learn them all, and they, u they really use them all. I was at a Taiwanese college game once, the only time I've been to Asia, and the kids threw five different pitches. And you're thinking, like, one, they can't all be that good, right? There's been, David Cohn is one of the only guys I can think of who could actually throw five, six different pitches, and they were all actually decent. And you wonder is he going to how well is he learning his craft if he's doing all of these different pitches and what is the impact on the arm because he's probably not throwing all of them correctly as cleanly as possible and then you wonder okay so maybe Tanaka now he throws it fine but when he was originally learning the pitch was he throwing it with improper less proper mechanics and that created some damage and then you know, the, the more we the, the more discussion there is about this stuff I was talking to Glenn Slicek at ASMI the other day it's just, a lot of the damage that's done is done years ago, and it just shows up later. So it's harder for us mentally to connect the cause to the effect. But it is the, it's it's there. The cause, the cause, the damage was probably done years before the actual the actual injury took place. And to your point, earlier this year, I had a general manager say to me, "Look, when we put innings restrictions and pitch counts on these guys, we're treating them as if they're a blank slate." Yeah. And he said, "They're not." No. They've been pitching for 10 years, it's a smart GM. and they've been yep. doing things. Yeah, and, and they've been doing things that we can't possibly know about. We can't possibly quantify. We can't dig out that information, which is why, as you know, there's more talk in baseball among teams of look. All these innings restrictions almost are folly. In, They're in not working. To, in, right in terms of a one size fits all uh, situation. And again, I, I just want to put out the reminder. We don't yet know exactly what's going on. It may be much less than any kind of a Tommy John situation. Yeah, we so hope we'll so. see. Now, I think, yeah, I think you'll agree with me on this. And I read a couple of columns today uh, from people in the New York area who are basically saying, you know what, the Yankees don't have Tanaka, who without a doubt has been their most valuable player in the yes. first uh, half of the season. Oh, where are you know, they? That's without? it. They, right. They can't win. It's it's over. They should be sellers at the trade deadline. And look, I. I I don't think they're going to make the playoffs if Tanaka's out. But at the same time, they are not constructed that way, and they don't think that way. And they have never been sellers at the trade deadline uh, since George Steinbrenner bought the team in 1973. They're, they are absolutely, because of the other money that they have invested in this team, they will try to win. And even before this news, in recent days, they've been poking around in the starting pitching market. You know, mm -hmm. They weren't thinking that Brandon McCarthy was the be-all, end-all to help the rotation. So I drew up a list in the column today of guys who may or may not be available in the market, depending on what uh, you know the interest level of their particular teams is to actually move them. And so I wanted to run some names past you as possible fits for the Yankees and get a, a quick reaction on each of these guys. Ross mm -hmm. Detweiler of the Nationals, who's buried at the back end of their bullpen. He has yep. a history of a as a starting pitcher. 
as I wrote in the column, he's making just $3 million this year. He certainly is not extended right now in terms of his pitch count. The Yankees, if they traded for him, would have to build him up. And I don't see the Nationals having a lot of incentive to move him rather than just keeping him as their own safety net. What do you think? Yeah, I, what would be the end game for them in dealing him? The, I mean, the one thing I could think of, see, if I'm them, I, they don't have a lot of holes to fill. Detweiler is one of the few pieces they have who'd have value to another team for them to acquire a major league asset, something they decide that they do need. Because I think a lot of teams would look at Detweiler and say, it's you know, a not too expensive major league starter. He go into most teams' rotations at this point, certainly if you're a contender, if you're the Astros, say, I, not a contender, a seller. If you're the Astros, you're looking at Detweiler and saying, plug that guy right into the rotation, stretch him out, but he, he goes into our rotation, he's into our rotation um, for the rest of the season once he's uh, stretched out to be able to do that. But for the Nets, it would have to be a deal where they're getting something major league in return to help them or getting a minor league asset who they then turn around and flip to somebody else. Mike Rizzo is not going to trade Ross Detweiler for prospects just for the sake of having the prospects. And the fact is their system is a little light on prospects to potentially include in a deal like this. So if they, if they were to move Detweiler at all, it would be to get those prospects so they could just turn around in a second deal a day later to go get whatever other piece they decide they need. Kevin Correa, the Twins, he's making $5.5 million this year. Uh, I think his ERA is around 4-1 right now. I, I don't see him as being a good fit for the same reason that Phil Hughes wasn't a good fit for the Yankees ball because park. he, generally speaking, is a fly ball pitcher in their park. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the Phil Hughes story is amazing because he's turned into sort of the, you know, the more extreme version of Carlos Silva now that he's gone to Minnesota. But he was, he was a bad fit for the Yankees' new stadium, a right, especially a right-handed pitcher who's fly ball oriented and doesn't have a great pitch to get lefties out. That's the wrong fit. And frankly, if the Yankees want to go out and get a starter, they got to aim higher than Correa, I think. I think they need a guy who's got a little more impact. McCarthy, to me, is, was kind of the baseline. You want McCarthy or better now if you're going to go make a second deal. John Danks of the White Sox is interesting to me because, look, the Yankees don't have a, a great farm system now. We know that, and they recognize that. That's why they went out and signed all those players in the international market last week. And if the Yankees are going to upgrade, it's going to be because they're taking on money. And I don't even know if the White Sox are interested in trading John Danks because they would have to replace him if they deal him. But he's making 14.25 this year, 14.25 next year, 14.25 in 2016. He's getting further away from his Tommy John surgery. And you know what? If the White Sox were looking for an opportunity to get out from underneath dollars, maybe this would be a fit. I could see that, just to get the flexibility. Not even necessarily that they think Danks is bad or a poor value. Probably not a great value at that dollar figure, but it's not outrageous. If he were out in the free agent market, he'd probably get 10, 11, something like that. But it does seem like they place a fairly high value on financial flexibility at this point. It's like Rick Hahn is trying to just reboot the roster. Not necessarily rebuild, but just get himself free of some of the contracts that he inherited so that he can turn around and spend that money in different places. And they're, they're in a similar situation to the Nationals in that the system is is weak, but their, their system is improving dramatically. Now, it sounds like they're going to get Carlos Renon signed in the next probably 48 hours or so, which is a nice big boost to the system. But I could see Han saying, we're still not quite where I want to be on the minor league side. So as much as we like John Danks, if we could flip him for a prospect and get some financial flexibility, it would probably make sense for them to do so. And remember, when we talk about the Yankees and how much money they have to spend, I don't know the exact details of what their insurance is with CC Sabathia, but presumably they're getting some relief uh, for this year if he's not going to pitch again, mm -hmm. uh, because usually that, that type of situation goes in segments, and so who knows? Maybe they're saving $8 million, maybe they're saving $10 million on CC during the course of this year. Here's a guy who I do think, in terms of the parameters of what the Yankees could offer and the motive on the other side, in theory, this would be a good fit. Cliff Lee of the Phillies. He threw 59 mm -hmm. pitches in a rehab start last night. He could be ready by the end of the month. Now, his contract is nuts. He's owed about $10 million <laughs> for this year, uh, for the rest of the season, $25 million for next season. Again, the Phillies have these ridiculous option things that they have at the back end of their contracts. $12.5 million uh, in a buyout and 2016 option. 
uh, you know, my question is, could the Phillies and Yankees actually agree on prospects? Because I could see the Phillies, who seem really unrealistic in their conversations, going to the Yankees saying, yeah, we want you to take on all that money, and we want to get high in prospects, and you guys don't have a lot. Yeah, I could absolutely see that. And I mean, I think the Philly, problem with the Phillies now is that it, it is not clear at all what direction they intend to take. I mean, Ruben is talking like this major league team – should be playing a lot better than they are, whereas I think outside observers are looking and saying, no, this is pretty much what the team is, actually. This is this is your true talent level. You should be in full-on sell mode, and they're not. Uh, maybe that'll change in the next couple of weeks, and I, you would have to think they'd like to at least try to get out from some of the money on Lee's contract because, uh, you know, it's a, it's similar to John Danks. It's not a terrible contract uh, because of how good Lee can be when he's healthy, but it's an enormous amount of money for a team that could really use some financial flexibility because the guy at first base is a contract they're probably just stuck with at this point. So if you can move one of your larger contracts, uh, and you'd probably rather move Lee than Hamels if you're looking at financial reasons, if you're looking at baseball reasons, it would make sense to potentially do that. But if they're going to the Yankees and saying, well, we want Aaron Judge and Severino and one more prospect, I mean, the Yankees should just say, look, we, we got other options. Cole Hamels of the Phillies is, of course, really accomplished, and he's throwing really well. Uh, but I do think that his contract is so big and so onerous, and he means so much to the Phillies that I just have a hard time believing that they could structure a deal with the Yankees. Because, again, I think they would ask for a bunch of prospects. Yep. The Yankees wouldn't have necessarily a lot to offer and certainly wouldn't have as much to offer as a team like the Dodgers would. The Dodgers, right? And, that's the, yeah, that's and on the top thing. of that, I, I yeah, and I, and I just, you know, the Phillies, if they're looking for prospects and for the other team to take on all or most of the money, it's going to be really difficult for those two teams to make a deal. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, what the, the Dodgers could out – pretty much outbid anybody in the starting pitching market. So if they want somebody and they're willing to trade two out of Seager, Peterson, and Julio Rios, they could, I think they could get pretty much any deal done. And Hamels, Southern California guy, they were Dodgers were rumored to be interested in him when he was approaching free agency. Uh, but again, it comes back to the question of what's the Phillies' direction? I mean, you see I've, yeah. Ruben has done some radio interviews and press interviews recently where he's indicated he thinks this team should be better. You don't know what he's getting from ownership, too. I always try to emphasize this to, to readers, too. Like, the GM comes out and says something, and you're like, well, he's crazy. He's an idiot. You know what? He might be saying what ownership wants him to say. If the owner says, you are not selling at the trade deadline, even if you're, as the GM, you, if Ruben's sitting there saying, God, we stink. We need to sell everybody. If David Montgomery is telling him, you're not a seller, you're not a seller. So, and then Ruben's hands are tied, and he can't go out publicly and say that, so he's got to wear it a little bit. And I, you know, I want to give Amaro some credit here in that it's possible that his ambiguity in talking about selling at the trade deadline this year is actually imposed on him from above. I absolutely agree with you in that case. You just never know, which is why a lot of times when I write columns and criticize particular teams, I, I usually don't specify a general manager because right. you, you don't know that, what the right? owner's you, saying. You, you do this for a while, and then you hear the off-the-record thing. I mean, I had to do this for a few years, and people started trusting me more, and they'd say, hey, you know, it's, I mean, I've had a couple GMs in the last few years say, look, you know, I want to trade so-and-so, but ownership says, oh, if we trade him, we won't get butts in the seats. Oh, we, need, we, can't, we can't sell too hard because then we won't have enough revenue in the short term, even if they know it's the right long-term move. And if you're the GM, you're just, you do not have that kind of autonomy. They're not all Billy Bean where – he can pretty much do anything he wants and doesn't – I mean, he has to answer to an owner, but ultimately the owner is investing him with that kind of independence. Very few GMs have that, and there is a, a financial top line and bottom line that they often still have to pay attention to. And it does seem like David Montgomery, to some extent, wants to try to protect this year's revenue line, even though I don't think it's going to work. If that's his belief, he's in charge. He gets to make that decision and to say to Amaro, you can't. If Amaro is going to him and saying the right move is to trade Lee, Hamels, Utley, Rollins, and anything else that's not nailed down. If Montgomery says no, that's the end of it. Let's just touch on this guy, David Price of the Rays, the best pitcher in the market. I do believe that uh, Andrew Friedman, the, the Rays general manager, would consider trading anybody in the division, but I do think there's going to be a surtax uh, yep. if they were to do that. And let's face it, the price for David Price was set last week when uh, yep. the Rays discussed very seriously trading Addison Russell for Price, he's one of the best prospects in baseball. The Yankees don't have anybody comparable. 
No. So that almost certainly is not going to happen. Ian I, Kennedy it, it, the pot. I agree. Uh, go go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I agree. I don't think the Yankees could do it. If prices, if the Rays can't get that kind of return for price, they're just not going to trade him. Exactly. Uh, Ian Kennedy of the Padres, he pitched for the Yankees in the past. He's got a 3.71 ERA this year. He's making $6.1 million. He'll be a free agent after next year. Look, we saw the Yankees in the past bring back the Javier Vasquez. It didn't pay off. I think under most circumstances they would not consider doing this. Mm-hmm. But as they wrote in the column, desperate times call for desperate measures. Maybe you do it because the Padres are actually one of the few teams willing to trade guys now. And, yes, Ian Kennedy's not a great fit for your ballpark. He's probably not a great fit for the league. But maybe it's a Brandon McCarthy-type move. Uh, I agree with everything you said. I think he's a terrible fit for the ballpark. I think his adjust, if you park adjust his numbers, he's actually been a below-average starter this year because Petco is such an extreme pitcher's park. And I would not read too too much into that. Uh, but if I were playing in Yankee Stadium, uh, the White Sox, the Rockies, the, you know, the, there are certain situations where I'd say, you know what, Kennedy's just he's a bad fit for us. The Reds, who could certainly be looking for a starter. I would just pass on Kennedy. He's a fly ball guy, fringy fastball, not a lot of life to it. He's going to be homer prone if you put him into one of those environments. He's in a perfect spot right now, and the Padres should try to cash it in because he's probably created some superficial value for himself, but there's four or five teams out there that should just not be interested. This is an interesting guy to me, Bartolo Colon of the Mets. And let's mm-hmm. start out uh, and make this very clear. The Mets and the Yankees almost never trade with each other. Yeah. But at the same time, the Mets have this developing starting pitching in their organization. you got Matt Harvey coming back next year. At some point, they're going to have a surplus there, and they have this relatively small payroll for a team playing in a market like this of $85 million. Cologne's owed about $4 million for the rest of, the season, rest of this year, $11 million for next year. The Yankees know Cologne. He really mm-hmm. started his comeback with them. Uh, upon the advice of Tony Pena to the Yankees, this to me is not a bad option because I don't think it would cost a lot to get him, and I think there's uh, potential motivation for the Mets to just move the salary. Yes. One, I think the Mets could and should say, we will pay all of his salary for the rest of this year. You pick up next year, we'll cover you for this year. We've already committed it. A lot of teams are going to say, well, we don't have a lot of room in the budget for the rest of this year, which may or may not be true. It's just, I think a lot of that is just leverage in negotiations. But still, if you're the Mets, you could say, don't even worry about it. We got you covered. Just send us an extra prospect. You know, the price is a little bit higher. Maybe it's two sort of grade B prospects. I don't think you're getting any high-impact guys here. But that's a better fit. The Yankees have a bunch of those guys who are either second- or third-tier prospects while on that double-A Trenton club, or they've got some – better prospects, some higher ceiling guys playing an A-ball right now. And, and you, know, you know, you shouldn't trade an Aaron Judge, who I think might be the Yankees' best prospect at this point, for him. But could you trade an Eric Jagailo? Could you trade uh, one of the teenage guys off the Charleston roster? I mean, then, then you've got some, some options. And, uh, and, again, I think the Mets would be wise to trade him and go out and take that attitude. We'll, we'll pay the whole freight. You just pick up the 11 for next year. We got – the $4 million for the rest of this year. So it's essentially, hey, here's a, here's a costless Bartolo Colon if you send us prospects. And you know what? Every team that has looked at Colon has always been afraid of being uh, the team holding him while he, when he turns into a pumpkin right. whenever that right. happens because he's he 41 like years old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the fact is he's only got one year left on his contract. The Yankees, oh, yeah. as, as we mentioned, they may get some relief in CC Sabathia's contract, depending on how much he pitches going forward. Kuroda's a free agent after this year. Yep. Uh, presumably they would get some relief in Masahiro Tanaka's contract yep. if he winds up getting a Tommy John surgery. And, and so th- there are a lot of factors in there that, to me, make Cliff Lee and Bartolo Colon the two most likely guys, and so we'll have to just watch that. We've got a couple minutes left, Keith. Uh, I wanted to run a couple things past you. First off, the National League Central seems to be turning in the American League East. Yeah, great. All these teams are bunching together, and they're all getting hammered by injuries. Uh, when you Last night, for example, Brandon Phillips hurts his thumb. Billy Hamilton comes off with a hamstring issue with the Reds. Garrett Cole went back on the disabled list. The Brewers are losing. The Cardinals lost Yadier Molina last yeah, night. Right. What do you make of the National League Central right now? Well, it's great. Right? I mean, I think it's incredibly exciting. You have four teams that are probably buyers. One of those could change. 
I would say probably the Pirates are the most likely to have to flip the switch in the other direction. Just given the team payroll situation, I'm sure they don't want to at all. But they're the, of these four teams, that's the team that could most likely see things turn in a direction over the next two, three weeks where they have to, I guess, two weeks, where they would say either we're not buyers or we're fringe sellers. You know, I mean, they do have Francisco Liriano there where there's, you know, there's certainly going to be some interest in him if he's healthy at the deadline and they feel like they can uh, and they feel like they're not close enough to be buyers. But otherwise, I actually expect all four of these teams to be buyers as they approach the uh, as they approach the deadline. The Cardinals are the most interesting one because they're rumored to be in on starting pitchers. Jake Peavy, that one's been all over the place uh, the last couple of days at least, and they do have quite a few may, uh, minor league prospects who are close to the majors. So they're valued much more highly. There's kind of an exponential increase in the value of prospects as they get closer to major league ready. And the Cardinals are very strong in the upper levels or in the majors. You've got Tavares at the big league level, Stephen Piscotti, an outfielder in AAA, Tim Cooney's in AAA, Marco Gonzalez. I think they optioned him back to AA, actually, but he made his big league debut. they got a bunch of these guys where it doesn't have to be PV. Anyone they're talking to. It, they're going to line up with almost anybody because they've got a bunch of prospects and they've got some high ceiling guys and they've got a lot of sort of second tier depth prospects that would be very appealing to just about anybody. And other than PV, one guy you didn't mention before, but who I think would be a great fit with the Cardinals, Jorge De La Rosa, uh, that, that is the kind of guy who goes to the Cardinals. We've seen them over the last 10 years or so make trades for guys like that. And then he goes to the Cardinals and he shaves a run, run and a half off his ERA, has the, the two months of his life heading into free agency. And that's just – I've never heard those two teams connected on this guy. It's just looking at the history of the Cardinals. That's the kind of guy they tend to target and then do very well with. Yeah, and that that definitely would be an interesting place for De La Rosa. Another team for him, uh, as uh, Dan Connolly, the Baltimore Sun, wrote last night, the Orioles have been watching him and – Dan mm-hmm. Duquette likes his guys, and yeah. De La Rosa is one of his guys going way back, <laughs> so they could be a team interested in him. Let me run this past you on the Pirates, and I agree with you. You know, if the Pirates, who came into today four and a half games out in the National League Central, if they lose six games in the standings in the next few weeks, hey, it's easy. You become sellers. Yeah. But I do wonder if it might be more difficult for them to be sellers uh, this summer because of what's already happened this year. I think there's the sure. fan base there is generally unhappy with their decision around Gregory Polanco because mm-hmm. they were told, look, he's not ready, he's not ready, he's not ready. <laughs> and then since he's come up, he's been unbelievable. Right. He's Boy, really hey. transformed their yeah. offense. He's, In my opinion, I think his, his presence has really helped Andrew McCutcheon uh, because you know more guys on base means maybe better pitches for McCutcheon to hit. He's taken advantage of it. And I think it'd be tough for the Pirates front office, let's say if there's six games out or six and a half games out on July 30th saying, oh, sorry, yeah. we just don't think we're close enough, we're giving up. I think they would get hammered yeah. in that city in a year in which they're going to set an attendance mark. I agree with all of that. I think if I were advising Neil Huntington and we're at the point where we're saying, you know what, we're, we're probably – a little too far out of this. Our, our playoff odds are 5%, say, just because of the division they play in. I'm not, it's not a bad team in any way. But if they look and the standings are just unfavorable, and if you find out Cole's probably not going to be back till Labor Day because those lat issues take forever to heal properly and you don't want to risk him, I'd say instead let's be opportunistic sellers where we're not rebuilding, we're not selling everybody, potential free agents, and try to get somewhere along the lines, you know, if you're trading two or three of those guys off the back of the roster, get a major league player somewhere in there so that the major league team remains reasonably competitive. And if you do get lucky and everybody gets healthier, that you're not crushing your in-season chances. It is an extremely fine line to walk. I'd say very few teams have been able to do that well. I do think back to the A's in the late 90s, early 2000s, where yes. in the same week, you would see them sell one guy and turn around and buy another because they were really just trying to cash in on a guy whose value they didn't trust and go get maybe the next guy to replace him on the roster, someone, you know, an Isringhausen type where, you know, we're going to bring him in, make him a closer, and all of a sudden recreate some value. That's what the Pirates could do in the situation that you just outlined, which I think is probably pretty likely. I do think on paper they're maybe the third best team in the division, but they're so close in the standings right now they have to act as if they're 
serious contenders. And they may very well be. If, if they get more luck and health than the other teams in the division, they could easily end up winning it. And I do think that the front office is somewhat scarred by the criticism they got earlier this year from the yeah. fan base about not promoting. And that, that it will be on the front of their brains as they make that decision. Hey, Keith, thanks for doing this. Yep, my pleasure. It's time to make the call. Call to the legend on Baseball Tonight. Johnny Damon's played 18 years in his career, 10,917 plate appearances, 2,769 hits, 1,668 runs, 1,139 RBI, 408 steals, 1,003 walks. And you had two all-star appearances, Johnny, and this is the week where a lot of players learned that they uh, got to, to name to the all-star team. Your first time was in 2002. What was that like, and what was your favorite memory from that? Well, it was a uh, tremendous feeling. I was actually one of the uh, five finalists that the fans actually got to vote to see who goes to the uh, All-Star game. But fortunately for me, I was playing for Boston, and we know how those fans are uh, computer savvy, and um, they back their players. And so, I mean, they voted me in, and I believe it was by a landslide. I mean, obviously I was hoping I got into the All-Star game just, because of my numbers alone, but you know, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. But like I said, fortunately, I had the fans of the uh, Red Sox, and you know they got me in that year, and then they also got me in the year after we won the World Series. So uh, it was definitely a cool feeling. I obviously wish I could have gone to a few more All Star games, but uh, um, I'll take the uh, three or four days off um, during that time also. Yeah, and you uh, you played on teams where they had a lot of guys getting a lot of votes yeah. uh, in Boston and in New York, and I'm sure that and, and then early in your career you were on small market teams, and we know they usually only get one or two guys every year. Uh, that first year in 2002, what was cool about being on that team? Well, um, what was cool was just the uh, experience. I mean, you walk into an all-star um, clubhouse and they have all the balls and the bats and the stuff you have to sign and you know guys who have been there um, five six times already you know it's like old hat to them and like they were like oh man we got to sign those I, I was very happy to do it I was like um you know people wanted me here I'm going to enjoy this moment um you know the all-star festivities were great and you know, it was just a fun time. It was something very new to me. It, uh, it kind of reminds you of that first time going to the uh, postseason. You know, things are different. It's not a regular season baseball game anymore. It's uh, um, best players in the world, and uh, I was just hoping I stayed in my place. Now, did you? Uh, was there any player that you liked hanging out with in in 2002 that you liked being around that you really hadn't got a chance to talk to before? You know, I really liked being around Tory Hunter. It just always seems like he has a uh, positive attitude. Um, obviously, he can go and get it. And you know, he was the center fielder who actually started over me, so it was great for me to watch him and for him to go and rob. Barry Bonds home run and just see the kind of enthusiasm that he still um, has to this day. You know, he enjoys going out and playing the game of baseball. Among all the teams you played on, and you had so much success in your career and the teams you did, what was your favorite team that you played on? Shoot, my favorite team, I mean, obviously winning the World Series is a very easy thing to say, whether it was for Boston or New York, but I've got to say playing for the Oakland A's in 2001 was great because I learned how to play winning baseball, and I stopped worrying about all the things I couldn't control. You know, you go out, you play hard, but as soon as the game was over, um, we're not thinking about the game anymore. It's you know, get your rest or go have fun. But as soon as you uh, walk into the clubhouse the next day, it's time to uh, get ready to win another ball game. So I learned so much from playing on that team with 
a guy like Jason Giambi and you know Eric Chavez and Art Howe. So that was a great experience. I think the funnest time I had was when I was close to being uh, home when I played for Tampa. You know, I felt like a, I guess, a coach and a mentor. You know, the kids looked up to me, and we had such a great run, and we had success. Um, and I was so close to home, so anytime there was a day game, I would just jump in the car and get home and spend some time with the uh, family and spend some time at my house. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that about the uh, 2001 A's because, of course, you played on the, the, the 2004 Idiots. That was a term that you actually coined. I remember being in the press conference when you used that phrase, uh, and, and it caught fire as soon as you mentioned it. Uh, and then in 2009, you win with the Yankees. But I remember those 2001 A's. When you would go into that clubhouse, first off, it was the loudest clubhouse in baseball, without a doubt. And I remember specifically, and I'm sure you will too, that there was this big tool set that was in the middle of the clubhouse on a table because guys were playing with, like, uh, model cars, correct? Oh, it was incredible. I mean, the guys were all little kids. You know, they uh, they grew up together. It was like a frat house. It was like when we went to lunch, we would have 15 guys go. When we went out at night, it was the same thing. I mean, it was really fun. And then when we got to the clubhouse, I mean, nobody was scared to tell the other guy that they made a mistake. I mean, it was all open policy. It was um, hustle next time. You could have been safe um, in this situation. Uh, let's do this. Let's take, take, take and get the pitchers uh, pitch count up to 100 by the third or fourth inning and, and then we're going to blow out these teams in our second, third, fourth games of the series. So, I mean, we talked baseball um, when we crossed the lines, but as soon as uh, the games were over, it was, you know, let's let's forget about what happened today, uh, win or lose, and then let's go have a good time. And then show up to the ballpark the next day. It was, uh, um, you know, let's go beat some teams up. And, you can remember that second half we had that year. I believe we were yeah. 59 and 18, and I mean that kind of stuff just doesn't happen. Um, no, we didn't win 15 in a row or anything like that, but we kept winning um, eight in a row, then lose one, then we won six in a row, then we win eight in a row. I mean it was it was fun, um, and I do feel like we had the best team that year. But you know, uh, after you go up two nothing against the uh, Yankees, um, a, few, a few of us stopped hitting. You know, everything I was hitting uh, was landing in gloves, and we had Chavez and Tejada. They struggled the entire series, so I, I do feel like we had the best team that year, but unfortunately, the best team doesn't always win. You know, uh, Arizona caught a very hot streak, and they became champions. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm curious to, to if I'm right. Who was your favorite teammate that you had in your 18 years? Wow, there's there's so many. I, I, I was asked this question a couple weeks ago. I've got to say Jermaine Dye, Mike Sweeney, Jason Giambi. Those guys stand out to me. I mean, they're still close friends to this day. and I mean, those guys would give you their shirt off their backs um you know i i also have to throw in alex rodriguez in that equation i mean he's he was he's a student of the game and he he and i have known each other since um, i was 14 he was 13 so we always got along but uh he was a great teammate smart player um you know didn't really go and hang out like Giambi and I did, or Jermaine Dye and I did, or Mike and I did. So um, he he obviously has his uh, the way he prepares, but uh, great teammate. Do you keep in touch with Alex, and uh, what do you expect of him going forward after after this season? Um, yeah, I do keep in touch with him. Um, I I know he's training nonstop. I know he's enjoying. Uh, spending some time with his girls. I mean, this is 
if you think about it, his first summer that he's had since he was probably 13 or 14 years old. So uh, I, I know my first year out of the game, um, which was last year, it was my first summer at home, and I, I really had no idea what to do. I mean, I was constantly swimming. I was constantly on the lake. and um, You can only do that so many times, but watching your girls uh, grow up, I mean, that's a incredible feeling. And I know I've got um, four of my girls are sleeping here now, and they're going to be up in a second just um, wanting to do something. And I'm probably going to... Um, jump in the lake and go swimming with him. So I think Alex is having a great time um, watching his kids finally grow up. Johnny, what's your favorite individual moment from your career? Ooh, um, hands down, it's hitting that grand slam at Yankee Stadium to help get a lead and keep the lead against the Yankees in 2004. I mean, that's yeah, and, and but, uh, not to interrupt, but I, yesterday your name actually came up on Twitter a lot uh, during the World Cup as Germany was building uh, that huge lead. Uh, someone t I saw a couple people tweet out that was the Johnny Damon effect. It was oh, like wow. early in the game taking control uh, because your your Grand Slam, if I remember correctly, turned it from 2 nothing to 6 nothing. Yes, that's correct. And if we remember what happened in 2003, we weren't going to... Or I wasn't going to be happy because I know the Yankees. I mean, I know they can come back from any deficit. And so as you saw me rounding the bases, there was, you know, no smile. It was just like, all right, let's keep it going. And so that's great. I'm glad I got a World Cup reference. And uh, that was a uh, shock. Not that Germany won, but just, I mean, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So, uh Congrats to them. Now, I like to ask this of players, uh, you know, when they have moments like that, whether or not they can still see in their mind's eye the pitch coming in that Javier Vasquez threw to you in that spot. Do you still, still feel that and you, your swing and you remember uh, in your senses all the things that you felt as you're going around the bases? Yeah, yeah, I sure do. I, I know going up for that at bat, I wanted to at least get one run in and hopefully I got a base hit I could get two guys in um, because I remember the year before when uh, Mucina came in and you know struck out Baratek and then got me to hit a hard um, ground ball double play and that could have been a run that could have helped us keep our lead against the Yankees so I I wanted to make sure that we got a run in we got some more breathing room I got jammed a tiny bit but Vasquez, I believe going into that situation, I saw um, two pitches from him two, maybe three months earlier, and I hit a home run with those same pitches. So I was hoping he would try to get ahead of me, and that's the way pitchers had success against me was if they got ahead of me. And that situation, I didn't wait for that opportunity to happen. I, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to hit a fly ball to right field, and uh, fortunately there was a short porch there, and I snuck that home run in and uh, gave us a 6 nothing lead. Did you know off the bat that was gone? Um, I had a good feeling it was gone, but, you know, I've also hit some balls uh, better than that that didn't creep out of the ballpark so uh i had a feeling it was gone but it, you know baseball i mean who knows sheffield could have put planted his foot in the wall perfectly and come up with a uh, incredible catch but uh that didn't happen that time so uh i'm very fortunate and blessed uh, when that happened and that's always going to be a uh, defining moment in my career I remember Joe Girardi telling me about how, as he hit a triple in the 1996 World Series, it got so loud at Yankee Stadium that he could feel the ground shaking underneath his feet. Uh, and that, of course, was old Yankee Stadium. What do you remember about the sounds as you're rounding the bases on that? I just remember the stadium was silent. And that's a really tough thing to do is to silence the um, Yankee Stadium 
crowd. I mean, obviously you can hear a little bit of the Red Sox fans uh, going nuts. But out of it all, I think I remember the stories that I heard about that moment. Like, um, some kid came up to me and said he was walking around Fenway, and all of a sudden he thought an earthquake hit and <laughs> the ground started to tremble, and that was the moment that I hit the uh, Grand Slam, and he just couldn't believe that one hit can actually uh, cause that kind of a uh, um, vibration. So through the years, have you had a bunch of Red Sox fans come up and, and they t- almost, uh, where they tell you what they were doing and where they were when you hit that ball? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the stories nowadays are a lot nicer than <laughs> a couple of years ago. But, uh, you know, I think they realize now that this is a business players you know never really want to leave I, I don't think but you know unfortunately you're put in a situation where um, it's um, offers are too good to pass up um, teams are looking for a specific need and you go and you go and do it you, at the end of the day we're just ball players I mean we're um, you know we try to be businessmen we try to be more than just ball players, but I mean, being a ball player is what put us in this situation, you know. So uh, I just go out and play baseball. I figured that that was the moment that you were going to choose, but I wondered if maybe the the play in the 2009 World Series where you took two bases against the Phillies, if that might be in there too. Can you just describe what you remember about that play? Oh man! Well, every time I see the highlights of that, I'm thinking exactly what my players and the fans were thinking at that time, like what in the heck is he doing? But, uh, you know, we had Mick Keller at first base, and throughout the whole year he always just gave me a heads up and, like, um, he never told me to go, but just keep your eyes open if there's a base hit, third base is open. Um, But I knew Brad Lidge was dealing with that Slider. I knew he was slow to the plate. Um, I don't know. It, just in that situation, you have to make something happen because uh, scoring runs in the postseason can be very tough. Um, so I knew right away I w- was going to uh, steal a base, and because the throw was a bit offline, um, and I felt like I still had my. Uh, um, high school track speed behind me I uh, you know felt like I could take that opportunity but now looking at the replays I'm like man I'm a lot slower now than I was in high school so this um, I'm just glad it worked out I'm glad I had you know a two step head start on um, Pedro if those are the best moments of your career uh, what was the worst moment in your career individually Um, worst moment I would say going back to places to play and being booed. I mean, no ball player wants to get booed. Yeah, you... Oh, crap. Oh, sorry. Are you oh. okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'll be all right, but that didn't sound too good. It sounded like a lot of uh, wine glasses just broke. Oh, yeah. I, you know, just the fact that I feel like I am a nice guy, very courteous to the fans, signing autographs, but anytime you go back and play your former team, you know... Uh, it's just never a great thing um, to get booed. Yeah, they boo you because you you can make a difference in the game and all that good stuff. But um, being booed is not fun. I, you know, people might say, "Oh, it's fine. You don't hear anything." But for an outfielder to get booed, you hear everything because the fans are right on top of you. It's it's different if you're a shortstop or a second baseman because the you're so far away from um, from the fans, but when when you're an outfielder, I mean, you're you're right there, you're a target. But I'll tell you one thing: I would much rather get booed by an entire stadium instead of having you know, like a couple people here and there uh, blasting you. So uh, I know Toronto was always a tough place because of, Toronto doesn't get. Um, too loud, but when the fans start getting on you, you're like, oh my God, 
everybody hears. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, but being booed just is it, not fun. What was the along those lines? What was what did it feel like to get cheered at the reunion of the 2004 team? And what was that like behind the scenes? Well, it, it was great. Um, you know, it was so quick. So I don't know how long they cheered for me. For <laughs> But, uh, you know, we had such a team that had great chemistry, so everybody was hoping they were remembered and got cheered properly. But behind the scenes, it was great. I mean, we were joking about how um, fun the year was and how, yeah, there was pressure put on us by the fans and the media, but, you know, our the teammates, I mean, we just rallied around each other and uh, um, supported each other and wanted to pick everybody up. But I thought it was great that um, we still have a couple guys still playing, you know, uh, Big Poppy and Bronson the Royal, unfortunately, uh, having surgery now. But uh, just seeing all the guys and the fact that we all looked decent. You know, a lot of times you see a team get back together after 10 years, it's really doesn't look uh, too promising, but uh, the guys all look pretty good. Well, Johnny, thanks for taking the time to do this, and I hope uh, I hope those wine glasses are okay. <laughs> uh, me too. It did not sound good, so uh, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. One last thing. Now, after our interview with Johnny Damon, I know, Josh, you checked in on Johnny to find out exactly what that crashing sound was. What did you learn? Yeah, I learned it wasn't just a couple glasses of wine. It was actually five bottles of very expensive vino. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so it was and even even worse I than know. Johnny initially thought. I asked you to forward on my offer to, you know, buy him a bottle of wine or something like that. Yeah. What did he say about Yeah, we, we both felt really bad about it, so I texted him after the interview. I said, you know, Johnny, we feel really bad for you. Next time Buster sees you, he'll buy you a, a bottle or a glass of wine and – uh, Johnny responded. He said, "Well, thanks for that, but I think Buster actually owes me about 50 glasses of wine at this point because of all the damage." Oh, man. So get ready to pay up, man. Oh, no kidding. Well, I'll take it out of your salary. <laughs> uh, Good luck. <laughs> That's it for today. My thanks to Johnny Damon and to Keith Law and to Josh Macker who produced this podcast. Have a great day, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Baseball Tonight podcast. If you're playing fantasy baseball, don't forget to listen to the Fantasy Focus podcast. Check out all podcasts at ESPN.com slash PodCenter. Baseball Tonight, the podcast. The next big thing. The next new kid. The next overnight sensation. The next rookie. One to watch. The next Hall of Famer. The next Intimidator. The next six time, the next king. Next, next, next. Who's next? Let's find out. Names are made here. The NASCAR Nationwide Series at New Hampshire, Saturday at 3 Eastern on ESPN2.